guys, this is the third marking period. All right, so chapter three. The wombat is dead. No assembly, no vote. Principal Principal made an announcement this morning. He said hornets better represent the Meriwether spirit better than foreign marsupials. Plus, the wombat mascot costume was going to suck money from the proms committee's budget. We are the hornets, and that is final. The seniors support this decision totally. They wouldn't be able to hold their heads if the prom had been moved to the Holiday Inn ballroom and to the gym. That would be so elementary school. Our cheerleaders are working on annoying chants that end in lots of buzzing. I think this was a mistake. I have visions of opposing teams making enormous fly swatters and giant uh, cans of insecticide out of paper mache to humiliate us during halftime. I'm allergic to hornets. One sting and my skin bubbles with hives and my throat closes up. I missed the bus because I couldn't believe how dark it was when my alarm clock went off. I need a clock that will turn on a 300 watt bulb when it's time to get up, either that or a rooster. When I realize how late it is, I do not rush. Why bother? My mom comes downstairs and I'm reading the funnies and eating oatmeal. You missed the bus again? I nod. Mom, you expect me to drive you again? Another nod. Mom, you'll need boots. It's a long walk and it snowed again last night. I'm already a row late. It is unexpected, but not harsh. The walk isn't that bad. It's not like she made me hike 10 miles through a snowstorm uphill in both directions or anything. The streets are quiet and pretty. The snow covers yesterday's slush and settles on the rooftops like powdered sugar on a gingerbread town. By the time I get to Fayette's, the town bakeries, I'm hungry again. Fayette's? make wicked good jelly donuts, and I have lunch money in my pocket. I decide to buy two donuts and call it brunch. I cross the parking lot and it comes out the door. Andy Evans with a raspberry dripping jelly donut in one hand and a cup of coffee in the other. I stop on a frozen puddle. Maybe he won't notice me if I stand still. That's how rabbits survive. They freeze in the presence of predators. He sets the coffee on top of his car and fumbles in his pocket for his keys. Very, very adult, this coffee car keys cut school guy. He drops the keys and swears. He isn't going to notice me. I'm not here. He can't see me standing in my purple marshmallow jacket. But of course, my luck with this guy sucks. So he turns his head and he sees me. And Wolf smiles, showing, oh, Granny, what big teeth you have. He steps towards me, holding out the donut. Want a bite? He asks, bunny rabbit bolts, leaving fast tracks in the snow. Get away, get away, get away. Why didn't I run like this before when I had a one piece talking girl? Running makes me feel like I'm 11 years old and fast. I burn a strip up down the sidewalk, melting snow and ice three feet on either side. When I stop, a brand new thought explodes in my head. Why go to school? The first hour of blowing off school was great. No one to tell me what to do, what to read, what to say. I it's like living in an MTV video, not with the stupid costumes, but wearing the butt strutting, I do what I want attitude. <laughs> I wandered down Main Street, beauty parlor, and 7-Eleven, bank, and card store. The rotating bake sign says it's 22 degrees. I wander up the other side. Appliance store, hardware store, parking lot, grocery store. My insides are cold from breathing in frozen air. I can feel the hair in my nose crackle. My strut slows to a foot dragging slump. I even think about trudging uphill to school. At least it's heated. I bet kids in Arizona enjoy playing hooky more than kids trapped in central New York. No slush, no yellow snow. I'm saved by a Centro bus. It coughs and rumbles and spits out two old women in the front of the grocery store. I climb on. Destination, the mall. I never think about the mall being closed. It's always supposed to be there like milk in the refrigerator or God. It is just opening when I get off the bus. Store managers juggle key rings and extra large coffees. Then the gate uh, cage gates fly up in the air. Light, lights wink on in the fountains jump. Music plays behind the giant ferns and the mall is open. White haired gr grandmas and grandpas power walk squeak squeak going so fast they don't even look at the window displays. I hunt spring fashions. Nothing that fits last year fits now. How can I shop with mom if I don't want to talk to her? She might love it, no arguing that way, but then I'd have to wear the clothes she picks out. Conundrum, a three point vocabulary word. I sit by the central elevator where they set up for Santa's workshop after Halloween. 
The air smells like French fries and floor cleaner. The sun through the skylight is summer hot and I shed layers, jacket, hat, mittens, sweaters. I lose seven pounds in half a minute. I feel like I could float up alongside the elevator. Tiny birds sing uh, above me. No one knows how they got in, but they live in the mall and seem pretty. I lie on the bench and watch the birds weave through the warm air until the sun burns so bright I'm afraid it will make holes in my eyeballs. I should probably tell someone. Just tell someone. Get it over with. Let it out. Blurt it out. I want to be in fifth grade again. Now that is a deep, dark secret, almost as big as the other one. Fifth grade was easy. Old enough to play outside without mom, too young to go off the block. Perfect leash. Um, a rent-a-cop strolls by and he studies the wax woman in the Sears window and then strolls back the other way. He doesn't even bother with a fake smile or, are you lost? I'm not in fifth grade. He starts back for a third pass, his finger on his radio. Will I turn my ear? Turn me in. Time to time to find the bus stop. I spend the rest of the day waiting for it to be 2:48 so that it's not all different from school. I I figured I learned a good lesson and set my alarm clock early for the next day. I wake up on time for four days in a row and get on the bus four days in a row. Ride home after school. I want to scream. I think I'll need to take a day off every once in a while. Hair woman has been buying new earrings. One pair hangs all the way down to her shoulders. Another has bells on it like the pair that Heather gave me for Christmas. I guess I can't wear mine anymore. That should be a law. It's Nathaniel Hawthorne's month in English. Poor Nathaniel. Does he know what we've done to him? We're reading the Scarlet Letter one sentence at a time and tearing it up and chewing on its bones. It's all about symbolism, says hair woman. Every word chosen by Nathaniel, every comma, every paragraph break, they're all done on purpose. To get a decent grade in her class, we have to figure out what he was trying to say. Why couldn't he just say what he meant? Why they uh, would they pin scarlet letters on his chest, B for blunt, S for straightforward? I can't whine too much. Some of it's fun. It's like a code, breaking into his head and finding the keys to his secrets. Like the whole guilt thing. Of course, you know, the minister feels guilty and Hester feels guilty, but Nathaniel wants us to know that this is a big deal. If he kept repeating, she feels guilty, she feels guilty, she feels guilty, it'd be a boring book and no one would buy it. So he planted symbols like the weather and the whole light and dark thing to show us how Hester feels. I wonder if Hester tried to say no. She's kind of quiet. We would get along. I see us living in the woods, wearing that A, me, um, with an S, maybe S for silent, stupid, for scared, S for silly, for shame. So the code breaking part was fun for the first lesson, but a little of that goes a long way. Hair woman is hammering it to death. Hair woman, the description of the house with bits of glass embedded in the walls. What does that mean? Utter silence from a clock from the glass. A fly left over the fall the from fall buzzes against the cold window. The locker slams in the hall. Hair woman answers her own question. Think of what it would look like, a wall with glass embedded in it. It would reflect, sparkle, shine on sunny days maybe. Come on, people, I shouldn't have to do this by myself. Glass in the wall. We would use that on top of prison walls nowadays. Hawthorne is showing us that the house is a prison or a dangerous place maybe. It is hurtful. Now I ask you to find some examples of use of color. How or who can list a few pages where color is described? A fly buzzes, a farewell buzz and dies. Rachel slash Rochelle, my ex-best friend. Who cares what the color means? How do you know what he meant to say? I mean, did he leave another book called Symbolism in my books? If he didn't, then you can just be making all of this up. Does anyone really think this guy sat down and stuck all these hidden meanings into his story? It's just a story. Hair woman, this is Hawthorne, one of the greatest American novelists. He didn't do anything by accident. He was a genius. Rachel Rochelle, I thought we were supposed to have opinions here. My opinion is that it's kind of hard to read, but the part about Hester gets in trouble and the preacher guy almost gets away with it, well, that's a good story but I think you're making all of this symbolism stuff up. I don't believe any of it. Hair woman, do you tell your math teacher you don't believe that three, uh, three times four equals 12? Well, Hawthorne's symbolism is just like multiplication. 
Once you figure it out, it's clear as day. The bell rings and Hair Woman blocks the door and gives out our assignment. A 500 word essay on symbolism, how to find hidden meanings in Hawthorne. The whole class yells at Rachel Rochelle in the hallway. That's what you get for speaking up. Mr. Freeman has found a way around the authorities again. He painted the names of all of his students on one wall of the classroom and then made a column for each week of left in school. Each week, he evaluates our progress and makes a note on the wall. He, ca he calls it a necessary compromise. Next to my name, he's painted a question mark. My tree is frozen. A kindergartner could carve a better tree. I stopped counting the linoleum blocks I've ruined. Mr. Freeman has reserved the rest of them for me. Good thing too. I'm dying to try a different subject, something easy like designing an entire city or copying the Mona Lisa, but he won't budge. He suggested I try a different medium. So I used purple finger paints. The paint cooled my hands, but did nothing for my trees. Trees. On the shelf, I found a book of landscapes filled with illustrations from every stinking tree that grows. Sycamore, linden, aspen, willow, fir, tulip, poplar, chestnut, elm, spruce, pine. Their barks, flowers, limbs, needles, nuts. I found a regular forester, but I can't do what I'm supposed to. The last time Mr. Freeman had anything good to say to me was when I made that stupid turkey bone thing. Mr. Freeman is having his own problems. He mostly sits on his stools and stares at his new canvas. It is painted one color, so blue it's almost black. No light comes out of it or goes in. No shadows without light. Ivy asks him what it is. Mr. Freeman snaps out of his funk and looks at her while he just realized the room was full of students. Mr. Freeman, it is Venice at night. It is the color of an accountant's soul, a love rejected. I grew mold on an orange this color when I lived in Boston. It's the blood of imbeciles. Confusion, tenure, the inside of a lock, the taste of iron, despair, a city with streetlights shot out, smoker's lung, the hair of a small girl who grows up hopeless, the heart of a school board director. He is warming up for full-fledged rant when the bell rings. Some teachers rumor whispers he's having a breakdown. I think he's the sanest person I know. Nothing good ever happens at lunch. The cafeteria is a giant sound stage where they film daily segments of teenage humiliation rituals, and it smells gross. I sit with Heather as usual, but we're going off by ourselves in a corner by the courtyard, not near the Marthas. Heather sits so her back is to the rest of the cafeteria. She can watch the wind shift the drifts of snow trapped in the courtyard behind me, and I can feel the wind seep through the glass and penetrate my shirt. I'm not listening too closely as Heather is ahem her way to what is on her mind. The noise of 400 mouths moving, consuming, pulls me away from her. The background pulsing of the dishwasher is the squeal of announcements that no one hears. This is Vespery, the hornet haven. I'm a small ant crouched by the entrance with the winter wind at my back. I smother my green beans with mashed potatoes. Heather nibbles through her Jamaica. I do that to you and whole grain roll and blows me off while she eats her baby carrots. Heather, this is really awkward. I mean, how do I say something like this? No matter what, no, I don't want to say it like that. I mean, we kind of got paired up at the beginning of the year when I was new and didn't know anyone, and that was really, really sweet of you. But I think it's time for both of us to admit we just are very different. She stutters her non-fat yogurt. I tried to think of something bitchy, something wicked and cruel. I can't. You mean we're not friends anymore? Heather, smiling with her mouth, not with her eyes. We never really, we never really, really friends, were we? I mean, it's not like we ever, I ever slept at your house or anything. We like to do different things. I have my modeling and I like to shop. I like to shop. You don't like anything. You're the most depressed person I've ever met. And excuse me for saying this, but you are no fun to be around and I think you need professional help. Up until this very instant, I had never seriously thought of Heather as anyone, as, as my one true friend in the world. And now I'm desperate to, uh, to be her pal, her buddy, to giggle with her, to gossip with her, for her to paint my toenails. Me. 
I was the only person who talked to you on the first day of school, and now you're blowing me off because I'm a little depressed? Isn't that what friends are for? To help each other out in bad times? Heather, I knew you would take this the wrong way. You're just so weird sometimes. I squint and look at the hearts on the other side of the room. Lovers can spend $5 to get a red or pink heart with their initials on it and mount it to the wall for Valentine's Day. It looks so out of place, Lowe's red splotches on blue. The jocks, excuse me, the student athletes sit in the front of the hearts to judge the new romances. Poor Heather, there is no Hallmark card for breaking up with friends. I know what she's thinking. She has a choice. She could have hang out with me and get the reputation of being a creepy weirdo who might show up with a gun someday. Or she can be a Martha, one of those girls who gets good grades, do nice things, and ski well. Which would you choose? Heather, when you get through this life sucks phase, I'm sure lots of people will want to be your friend. But you can't just cut classes and not show up to school. What's next? Hanging out with the dopers? Me. Is this the part where you're trying to be nice to me? Heather, you have a reputation. Me. For what? Heather, look. You can't eat lunch with me anymore. I'm sorry. Oh, and don't eat those potato chips. They'll make you break out. She neatly wraps her trash into a wax paper ball and deposits it in the garbage can. Then she walks over to the Martha table. Her friends scooch down to make room for her. They swallow her whole. She never looks back at me. Not once. I cut class. You cut class. He, she, it cuts class. We cut class. They cut class. We all cut class. I can't say this in Spanish because I didn't go to Spanish today. Gracias, adios. Hasta luego. When we get off the bus on Valentine's Day, a girl with white blonde hair bursts into tears. I love you, Angela. Is spray painted onto the snow bank along the parking lot. I don't know if Angela is crying because she's happy or because her heart's desire can't spell. Her honey is waiting with a red rose. They kiss right there in front of everybody. Happy Valentine's Day. It caught me by surprise. Valentine's Day was a big hairy deal in elementary school because you got to give cards to everyone in class, even the kid who made you step in dog poo. Then the class mom brought pink frosted cupcakes and we traded those little candy hearts that said hot baby and be mine. The holiday went underground in middle school. No parties, no shoeboxes filled with red cut out hearts from your drugstore Valentines. To tell someone you liked them, you had to use layers and layers of friends. As in, Janet told me to tell you that Stephen told me that Dougie said Carmen was talking about to April, and she hinted that Sarah's brother Mark had a friend named Tony who might like you. What are you going to do? It's easier to floss with barbed wire than admit you like someone in middle school. I go with the flow towards my locker. We're all dressed in down jackets and vests, so we collide and roll like bumper cars at a state fair. I notice envelopes taped to some lockers and don't really think about it until I find one on mine. It says, Melinda. Has to be a joke. Somebody has put it there to make me look stupid. I peer over my left sh shoulder and then my right for groups of evil kids pointing at me. All I see were backs of heads. What if this is real? What if it's from a boy? My heart stops, then stutters and pumps again. No, not Andy. His style is definitely not romantic. Maybe David Petrowski, my lab partner? He watches me until he thinks I can't see him, afraid I'm going to break lab equipment or faint again. Sometimes he smiles at me, and an anxious smile, the kind you use that, on a dog that might bite. All I have to do is open the envelope. I can't stand it. I walk past my locker and go straight into biology. Mrs. Keene decided it'd be cute to review birds and bees in honors of Valentine's Day. Nothing practical, of course. No information about why hormones make you crazy and why your face only breaks out at the worst time or how to tell if somebody really gave you a Valentine's Day card on your locker. No, she really teaches us about the birds and the bees. Notes on love and betrayal are passed hand in hand if, as if the lab tales were lanes of Cupid's Highway. Miss, Mrs. Keynes draws a picture of an egg with a baby chick inside. David Petrowski is fighting to stay awake. Does he like me? I make him nervous. I think I'm going to ruin his grade. He thinks I'm going to ruin his grade, but maybe I'm growing on him. Do I want him to like me? I chew my thumbnail. No, I don't. I just want anyone to like me. I want a note with a heart on it. I pull the edge of my thumbnail back too far and it bleeds. 
I squeeze my thumb so the blood gathers in a perfect sphere before it collapses and slides towards the palm of my hand. David hands me a tissue. I press it into the cut. The white cells of the paper dissolve as the red floods them. It doesn't hurt. Nothing hurts except small smiles and blushes that flash across the, the room like tiny sparrows. I open my notebook and write a note to David. Thanks. I slid the notebook over. I slid the notebook over to him. He swallows hard, his Adam apple bouncing to the bottom of his neck and back up again. He writes back. You're welcome. Now what? I squeeze the tissue harder on my thumb to concentrate. Miss Keene's baby bird hatches on the board and I draw a picture of Mrs. Keene as a robin. David smiles. He draws a branch under her feet and slides the notebook back to me. I try to connect the branch to a tree. It looks pretty good, better than anything I've drawn so far in art. The bell rings and David hand, David's hand brushes against mine as he picks up his books. I bolt from my seat, afraid to look at him. What if he thinks I've already opened his card and I hate his guts, which is why I didn't say anything. But I can't say anything because the card could be a joke or from another silent watcher who blends in with the blur of lockers and doors. My locker card is still there, a white patch of hope with my name on it. I tear it off and open it and something falls to my feet. The card has a picture of two cutesy teddy bears sharing a pot of honey. I open it. Thanks for understanding. You are the sweetest. It is signed with a purple pen. Good luck, Heather. I bend down and what dropped from the card. It was a friendship necklace I had given to Heather in a fit of insanity around Christmas. Stupid, stupid, stupid. How stupid could I be? I hear the crackling inside of me. My ribs are collapsing in on my lungs, which is why I can't breathe. I stumble down the hallway, down another hall, and down another hall, until I find my very own door and slip inside and throw the lock, not even bothering to turn on the lights, just falling, falling a mile downhill into the bottom of my brown chair, where I sink my teeth into my soft white skin on my wrist and cry like the baby I am. I rock, thumping my head against a cinder block wall. A, a half-forgotten holiday has unveiled every knife that sticks inside me, every cut. No Rachel, no Heather, not even a silly geeky boy who would like the inside girl I think I am. I find Lady Mercy Hospital by accident. I fell asleep on the bus and missed them all completely. The hospital is worth a try. Maybe I can learn some pre-med stuff for David. In a sick kind of way, I love it. There are waiting rooms on almost every floor. I don't want to attract too much attention to myself, so I stay on the move, checking my watch constantly, trying to look as if I have a reason for being here. I'm afraid I'll get caught, but the people around me have things to worry about. The hospital is a perfect place to be invisible, and the cafeteria food is better than the schools. The worst rating room is on the heart attack floor. It is crowded with gray faced women twisting their wedding rings and watching the door for a familiar doctor. One lady just sobs. She doesn't care that total strangers watch her nose drip or that people can hear her as soon as she gets they get off the elevator. She cries, stops just short of screaming. They make me shiver. I snag a couple of copies of people's magazines and I'm out of there. The maternity ward is dangerous because people there are happy. They ask me questions. Who are you waiting for? When is the baby due? Is it my mother, my sister? If I wanted people to ask me questions, I would have gone to school. I say I have to call my father and flee. The cafeteria is cool, huge, full of people wearing doctor and nurse clothes with college degree posters or posture and beepers. I always thought hospital people would be real health nuts, but these guys eat junk food like it's going out of style. Big piles of nachos and cheeseburgers as wide as plates, cherry pie, potato chips, all of the good stuff. One lone cafeteria worker named Lola stands by a steamed fish and onion tray. I feel bad for her, so I buy the fish platter. I also buy a plate of mashed potatoes and gravy and a yogurt. I find a seat next to a table of serious, frowning, silver-haired men who use words so long, I'm surprised they don't choke. Very official. Nice to hang around people who sound like they know what they're doing. After lunch, I wander up to the fifth floor to adult surgery wing where waiting family members concentrate on the television. I sit where I, where I can watch the nurse's station and beyond that, a couple of hospital rooms. It looks like a good place to get sick. The doctors and nurses seem smart, but they smile every once in a while. The laundry room worker pushes an enormous basket of green hospital gowns, the kind that show your butt if you don't hold it closed, to a storage area. 
I follow him. If anyone asks, I'm looking for a water fountain. No one asks. I pick up a gown. I want to put it on and crawl under the white knobbly blanket and white sheets in one of those high off the ground beds and sleep. It's getting harder to sleep at home. How long would it take for the nurses to figure out I don't belong here? Would they let me rest for a few days? A stretcher pushed by a tall guy with muscles sweeps down the hallway. One woman walks beside it, a nurse. I have no idea what's wrong with the patient, but his eyes are closed and a thin line of blood seeps from a bandage on his neck. I put the gown down. There's nothing wrong with me. There are really sick people, sick that you can see. I head for the elevator. The bus is on its way. We have a meeting with principal principal. Someone has noticed that I have been absent and I don't and that I don't talk. They figure I'm a, more of a head case than a criminal, so they call in a guidance counselor too. Mother's mouth twitches with words she doesn't want to say in front of strangers. Dad keeps checking his beeper, hoping someone will call. I sip water from a paper cup. If the cup were lead crystal, I would open my mouth and take a bite. Crunch, crunch, swallow. They want me to speak. Why won't you say anything? For the love of God, open your mouth. This is childish, Melinda. Say something. You're only hurting yourself by refusing to cooperate. I don't know why she's doing this to us. The principal hums loudly and gets in the middle. Principal, principal, we all agree we are here to help. Let's start with these grades. These are not what we expect from you, Melissa. Melinda. Principal, principal, Melinda. Last year, you were a straight B student. No behavioral problems, few absences, but the reports have been getting well. What can we say? That's the point. She won't say anything. I can't get a word out of her. She's mute. Guidance counselor. I think we need to explore the family dynamics at play here. She's jerking us around to get attention. Me inside my head. Would you listen? Would you believe me? Bad chance. Dad. Well, something is wrong. What have you done to her? I had a sweet, loving little girl last year, but as soon as she comes up here, she clams up, skips school, and flushes her grades in the toilet. I golf with the school board principal, you know. We don't care who you know, Jack. We have to get Melinda to talk. Leaning forward, talking, looking at mom and dad. Do the two of you have marriage issues? Mother responds with unladylike language. Father suggests that the guidance counselor visit the hot, scary underground world. The guidance counselor grows quiet. Maybe she understands why I keep it zipped. Principal Principal sits back in his chair and doodles a hornet. Tick, tick, tick. I'm missing study hall for this. Nap time. How many days until graduation? I've lost track. Have a have to find a calendar. Mother and father apologize. They sing a show tune. What are we to do? What are we to do? She's so blue, we're just two. What, oh, what are we supposed to do? In my head world, they jump on, on uh, principal principal's desk and perform a tap dance routine. A spotlight flashes on them and a chorus line joins in. And the guidance counselor dances around with a uh, spangled cane. I giggle, zap, back in their world. Mother, you think this is funny? We're talking about your future, your life, Melinda. I don't know where you picked up that slacker attitude, but you certainly didn't learn it at home. Probably from the bad influences up here. Guidance counselor. Actually, Melinda has some very nice friends. I've seen her helping with a group of girls who volunteer so much. Meg Harcutt, Emily Briggs, Javon Fallon, principal, principal, stop shooting. Very nice girls. They all come from good families. He looks at me for the first time and tilts his head to one side. Are those your friends? Or those are your friends? Did they choose to be so dense? Were they born that way? I have no friends. I have nothing. I say nothing. I am nothing. I wonder how long it takes to ride the bus to Arizona. Meriwether in school suspension is my consequence. It is in my contract. It's true that when they tell you about not signing anything without reading it carefully, even better, pay a lawyer to read it carefully. The guidance counselor dreamed up a contract after my cozy get together in the principal's office. It lists a million things I'm not supposed to do and the consequences I'll suffer if I do them. The consequences of for minor offenses like being late to class or not participating were stupid. They want me to write an essay, so I took another day off school, and bingo, I earned a trip to Miss. A classroom painted white with uncomfortable chairs and a lamp that buzzes like an angry hive. The inmates of Miss are commanded to sit and stare at the empty walls. It's supposed to bore us into submission or prepare us for an insane asylum. Our guard dog today is Mr. Mac. He curls his lips and growls at me. I think this is part of his punishment for that bigoted crap he pulled in class. There are two other convicts with me. One has a cross tattooed on his shaved skull. 
He said something like a granite boy waiting for a chisel so he can carve himself out of the mountainside. The other kid looks completely normal. His clothes are a little freaky, maybe, but that's a misdemeanor here, not a felony. When Mr. Neg gets up to greet a late arrival, a normal-looking kid tells me he likes to start fires. The last companion is Andy Evans. My breakfast turns to hydrochloric acid. He grins at Mr. Neck and sits down next to me. Mr. Neck, cutting again, Andy? Andy Beast, no sir, one of your colleagues thinks I have an authority problem. Can you believe it? Mr. Neck, no more talking. I am Bunny Rabbit again, hiding in the open. I sit like I have an egg in my mouth. One move, one word, and the egg will shatter and blow up the world. I am getting seriously weird in my head. When Mr. Neck isn't looking, Andy blows in my ear. I want to kill him. I can't do anything, not even in art class. Mr. Freeman, a pro at staring out the window himself, thinks he knows what's wrong. Your imagination is paralyzed, he declares. You need to take a trip. Ears perk up from all over the classroom and someone turns down the radio. A trip? Is he planning a field trip? You need to visit the mind of a great one, continues Mr. Freeman. Papers flutters as the class sighs. The radio sign uh, sings louder again. He pushes the pitiful linoleum block aside and gently sets down an enormous book. Picasso, he whispers like a priest. Picasso, who saw the truth, who painted the truth, molded it and ripped it from the earth with two angry hands, he pauses. But I'm getting carried away, I nod. See Picasso, he commands. I can't do everything for you. You must walk alone to find your soul. Blah, blah, yeah. Looking at the pictures would be better than watching Snowdrift, and I open the book. Picasso sure had a thing for naked women. Why not draw them with their clothes on? Who sits around without a shirt on, plucking a mandolin? Why not draw naked guys, just to be fair? Naked women is art. Naked guys is a no-no, I bet. Probably because most painters are men. I don't like the first chapters. Besides all the naked women, he painted those blue, these blue pictures like he ran out of red and green for a few weeks. He painted circus people and some dangers who look and some dancers who look like they're standing in smog. He should have made them, <laughs> made them cough. The next chapter steals my breath away. It takes me out of the room. It confuses me while one little part of my brain jumps up and down screaming, I get it, I get it, cubism. Seeing beyond what is on the surface, moving both eyes and a nose to the side of the face, dicing bodies and tables and guitars as if they're celery sticks and rearranging them so that you have to really see them. Amazing. What did the world look like to him? I wish he had gone to Meriwether, high school at Meriwether. I bet we would have hung out. I searched the whole book and never see one picture of a tree. Maybe Picasso couldn't do trees either. Why did I get stuck with such a lame idea? I sketch a cubist tree with, with hundreds of skinny rectangles of branches. They look like lockers, boxes, glass shards, lips with triangle brown leaves. I drop the sketch on Mr. Freeman's desk. Now you're getting somewhere, he says. He gives me a thumbs up. I am a good girl. I go to every single class for a week. It feels good to know what the teachers are talking about again. The parents get the news flash from the guidance counselor. They aren't sure how to react, happy because I'm behaving or angry or still that they, they have to be happy about such a minor thing as a kid who goes to class every day. The guidance counselor convinces them I need a reward, a tutorial or something. They settle on new clothes. I'm out growing everything I own, but shopping with my mother to shoot me and put me out of my misery. Anything but a shopping trip with mom. She hates shopping with me. At the mall, she stalks ahead and chin high eyes, eyelids twitching because I won't try on the practical stylish clothes she likes. Mother is the rock. I am the ocean. I have to pout and roll my eyes for hours until she finally wears down and crumbles into a thousand grains of beach sand. I take a lot of energy. I don't think I have it in me. Apparently, mom isn't up to the dragon wine mall gig either. When they announce I've earned new clothes, they add that I get to get them at efforts so mom can use her discount. I'm supposed to take the bus after school and meet her at the store. In a way, I'm glad. Get in, bye, get out, like ripping off a band-aid. It seems like a good idea until I'm standing at the bus stop in front of the school as a blizzard rips through the county. The wind chill must be 20 below and I don't have a hat or mittens. I try keeping my back to the wind, but my rear end freezes. Facing it is impossible. 
The snow blows up under my eyelids and fills my ears. That's why I don't hear the car pull up next to me. When the horn blows, I nearly jump out of my skin. It's Mr. Freeman. Need a ride? Mr. Freeman's car shocks me. It's a blue Volvo, a safe Swedish box. I had a figure for an old VW bus. It's clean. I have visions of art supplies and posters and rotting food everywhere. When I get in, classical music plays quietly. Well, wonders never cease. He says dropping me off in the city is only a little out of his way. He'd love to meet my mother. My eyes widen in fear. Maybe not, he says. I brush the melting snow from my head and hold my hands in front of the heating vent. He turns the fan at full blast. As I thaw, I count the mileage markers on the side of the road, keeping an eye out for an interesting roadkill. We had a lot of dead deer in the suburbs. Sometimes poor people take the venison for their winter's meat, but most of the time the carcass is rot until their skin hangs like ribbons over their bones. Oh. We head west to the big city. You did a good job with the Cuba sketch, he says. I don't know what to say. That's a dead dog. He doesn't have a collar. I'm seeing a lot of growth in your work. You are learning more than you know. Me. I don't know anything. My trees suck. Mr. Freeman puts on his turn signal and looks in the rearview mirror, pulls into the left lane, and passes a beer truck. Don't be so hard on yourself. Art is about learning mistakes or making mistakes and learning from them. He pulls back into the right lane. I watch the beer truck fade into the snowstorm in the side mirror. Part of me thinks maybe he's driving a bit too fast with all of that snow, but the car is heavy and doesn't slip. The snow that had caked on my socks melts into my sneakers. All right, but you said we had to put emotion into our art. I don't know what that means. I don't know what I'm supposed to feel. My fingers fly up and cover my mouth. What am I doing? Mr. Freeman, art without emotion is like chocolate cake without sugar. It makes you gag. He sticks his finger down his throat. Next time you work on your trees, don't think about trees. Think about love or hate or joy or rage. Whatever makes you feel something. It makes your palms sweat and your toes curl. Focus on that feeling. And when people don't express themselves, they die one piece at a time. You'd be shocked at how many adults are really dead inside, walking through their days with no idea who they are, just waiting for a heart attack or cancer or a Mack truck to come along and finish the job. It's the saddest thing I know. He pulls off the exit and stops at the light at the bottom of the ramp. Something small and furry and dead is crumbled by the sewer, storm sewer. I chew a scab off my thumb. The effort sign blinks in the middle of, of the block. Over there, I say, you can drop me off in front. We sit for a moment, the snow hiding the other side of the street, a cello solo thrumming through the speakers. Um, thanks, I say. Don't mention it, he answers. If you ever need to talk, you know where to find me. I unbuckle my seatbelt and open the door. Belinda, Mr. Freeman says. Snow filters into the car and melts on the dashboard. You're a good kid. I think you have a lot to say, and I'd like to hear it. I close the door. I stop by the manager's office, and the secretary says my mother is on the phone. Just as well. It'll be easier to find a pair of jeans without her around. I head for the young lady section of the store. Another reason they don't make any money. Who wants to be called a young lady? I need a size 10, as much as it kills me to admit. Everything I own is an 8 or a smaller, or a small. I look at my canoe feet and my wide, obnoxious ankle bones. Aren't girls supposed to stop growing at this age? When I was in sixth grade, my mom bought me all these books about puberty and adolescence, so I would appreciate what a beautiful, natural, and miraculous transformation I was going through. Crap, that's what it is. She complains all the time about her hair turning gray and her butt sagging, her skin wrinkling, that I'm supposed to be grateful for a face full of zits and hair in embarrassing places and feet that grow an inch overnight. Utter crap. The only matter what I, no matter what I try on, I know I'll hate it. Efforts has cornered the market on completely unfashionable clothes. Clothes that grandmas buy you for your birthday. It's a fashion graveyard. Just get a pair that fits, I tell myself. One pair, that's the goal. I look around. No, mom. I carry three pairs of the least offensive jeans into the dressing room. I'm the only person trying anything on. The first pair is way too small. I can't even get them over my butt. I don't bother with the second pair. They're a smaller size. The third pair is huge. Exactly what I'm looking for. I scurry out to the three-way mirror. With the extra large sweatshirt over top, I can't hardly tell if they're effort jeans. Still no mom. I adjust the mirror so I can see reflections of reflections. Miles and miles of me and my new jeans. I hook my hair behind my ears. I should have washed it. My face is dirty. I lean into the mirror. Eyes after eyes after eyes stare back at me. Am I in there somewhere? A thousand eyes blink. No makeup. Dark circles. I pull the side of the flaps of the mirrors closer, folding myself into the looking glass and blocking out the rest of the store. My face becomes a Picasso sketch, my body slicing into dissecting cubes. 
I saw a movie once where a woman was burned over 80% of her body and they had to wash all of her dead skin off. They wrapped her in bandages and kept her drugged, waiting for skin grafts. They actually sewed her into a new skin. I pushed my ragged mouth um, against the mirror. A thousand bleeding, crusting lips pushed back. What does it feel like to walk in new skin? Was she completely sensitive like a baby or numb without nerve endings, just like walking in a skin bag? I exhale and my mouth disappears in a fog. I feel like my skin has been burned off. I stumble through a thorn bush to thorn bush. My mother and father who hate each other. Rachel who hates me. A school that gags on me like I'm a hairball. And Heather. I just need to hang on long enough for new skin to graft. Mr. Freeman thinks I need to find my feelings. How can I not find them? They're chewing me alive like an infestation of thoughts and shame and mistakes. I squeeze my eyes shut. Jeans that fit. That's a good start. I have to stay away from the closet and go to all of my classes. I will make myself normal and forget the rest of it. We have finished the plant and unit in biology. Mrs. Keene drops 10 pound hints that the test will focus on seeds. I study how seeds get planted. This is actually cool. Some seeds spit their seeds into the wind. Others make seeds yummy enough for birds to eat so they get pooped onto passing cars. Plants make way more seeds than they need because they know that the life is not perfect and all seeds won't make it. Kind of smart when you think about it. People used to do that too. Have 12 or 15 kids because they figured some would die and some would turn out rotten and a couple would be hardworking, honest farmers. Who knew how to plant seeds? What seeds need to germinate? Seeds are inefficient. If a seed is planted too deep, it doesn't warm up at the right time. Plant it too close to the surface and a crow eats it. Too much rain in the seed molds. Not enough rain, it never gets, gets started. Even if it doesn't manage to sprout, it can be choked out by weeds and rooted up by a dog, mashed by a soccer ball, or asphyxiated by car exhaust. It's amazing anything survives. How plants grow quickly. How plants grow quickly. Most plants grow fast and die young. People get 70 years. A bean plant gets four months, maybe five. Once the itty bitty baby plant peeks out of the ground and it sprouts leaves so it can absorb more sun, then it sleeps and eats and sun bathes until it's ready to flower, a teenage plant. This is a bad time to be a rose or a zinnia or a marigold because people attack it with scissors and you cut it off what's pretty. But plants are cool. If a rose is picked, a plant grows another one. It needs to bloom to produce more seeds. I'm going to ace this test. My cafeteria strategy has changed since I have no friends in the known universe. First off, I don't go through the line for anything to avoid the vulnerable moment of coming out into the lunchroom, that moment when every head lifts to evaluate friend, enemy, or loser. So I brown bag it. I had to write a note to my mother asking her to buy my lunch bags, bologna, and a little container of applesauce. The note made her happy. She came home from the store with all kinds of junk food I could take. Maybe I could start talking to them, maybe a little, but what if I say the wrong thing? Baloney girl, that's me. I try to read while eating alone, but the noise gets between my ears and the page and I can't see through it. I observe. I pretend I'm a scientist on the outside looking in and the way Mrs. Keene describes her days watching rats get lost in mazes. The Marthas don't look lost. They sit in formation, a new girl in my old seat, a sophomore who just moved here from Oregon. Her clothes have a dangerously high percentage of polyester. She needs to get that taken care of. They nibble carrot sticks and olives, spread pate on stone ground uh, wheat crackers and trade bits of goat cheese. Megan and Emily and Heather drink cranberry apricot juice. Too bad I can't buy stock in the juice company. I'm watching a trend in the making. Are they talking about me? They certainly are laughing enough. I chop my sandwich and it barfs mustard on my shirt. Maybe they're planning the next project. They could mail snowballs to the weather deprived children in Texas. They could knit goat hair blankets for shorn sheep. I imagine what Heather might look like in 10 years after two children and 70 pounds. That helps a little. Rochelle takes a seat at the end of my table with Hannah, an exchange student from Egypt. Rochelle is now experimenting with Islam. She wears a scarf on the back of her head and some brown and red gauzy hair on pants. Her eyes are ringed with a black eyeliner thick as a crayon. I think I see her looking at me, but I'm probably wrong. Hannah wears jeans and a Gap t-shirt. They eat hummus and pita and titter in French. There, there is a sprinkling of losers like me scattered among the happy teenagers, prunes and the oatmeal of school. 
the others have social power to sit with the other losers. I'm the one sitting alone under the glowing neon sign, which reads complete and total loser. Not quite sane, stay away, do not feed. I go to the restroom to turn my shirt around so the mustard stain is hidden under my hair. We had eight inches of snow last night. In any other part of the country, that would mean a snow day, not in Santa Cruz. We never get snow days. It snows an inch in South Carolina, everything shuts down and they get on the six o'clock news. In our district, they plow early and often and put chains on bus tires. Hair Woman tells us they canceled school for a whole week back in the 70s because of the energy crisis. It was wickled cold and would have cost too much to heat the school. She looks wistful, wistful, one point vocabulary word. She blows her nose loudly and pops another smelly green cough drop. The wind blasts a snowdrift against the window. Our teachers need a snow day. They look unusually pale. The men aren't shaving carefully and the women, ne the women never remove their boots. They suffer some sort of teacher flu. Their noses drip, their throats gum up, their eyes are rimmed with red. They come to school long enough to infect the staff room, then go home sick when the sub shows up. Hair woman, open your books now. Who can tell me what the snow symbolized to Hawthorne? Class, Roan. Hawthorne wanted snow to symbolize cold. That's what I think. Cold and silence, nothing quieter than snow. The sky screams to deliver it, a hundred banshees flying on the edge of a blizzard. But once the snow covers the ground, it hushes as still as my heart. I sink into my closet after school because I can't face the idea of riding home on a bus full of sweaty, smiling teeth sucking up my oxygen. I say hello to my poster of Maya and my cubist tree. My turkey bone, bone, my turkey bone sculpture has fallen down again. I prop it up on the shelf next to the mirror. It slides back down and lies flat. I leave it up there and curl up in my chair. The closet is warm and I'm ready for a nap. I've been having trouble sleeping at home. I wake up because the covers are on the floor or because I'm standing at the kitchen door trying to get out. I feel safer in my little hideaway. I doze off. I wake up to the, girl, the sound of girls screaming, be aggressive, be aggressive, be aggressive. For a moment there, I thought I might have tripped into a land of truly insane, but then a crowd roars. It is a basketball game, last game of the season. I check my watch, 8.45. I've been asleep for hours. I grab my backpack and fly down the hall. The noise of the gym pulls me in. I stand by the door for the last time of the game, last minute of the game. The crowd chants down the last seconds. It's like New Year's Eve, then explode from the stands like angry hornets at the sound of the buzzer. We won, beating the Coatesville Cougars 51 to 50. The cheerleaders weep, the coaches embrace. I get up in the excitement and clap like a little girl. This is my mistake thinking I belong. I should have bolted from home immediately, but I don't. I hang around. I want to be part of it all. David Krasikowski pushes through the doors in the middle of a group of friends. He sees me looking at him and detaches himself from his pod. Belinda, where were you sitting? Did you see that last shot? Unbelievable, unfreaking believable. He dribbles an imaginary ball on the ground, fakes left, then right, and pulls up for a shot. David should stick to human right abuses. He goes on and on, a loose ball racing downhill. Hill. I, he I hear him talk. You think they had just won the NBA championship. He then invites me back to his house for a celeb um, celebratory pizza. David, come on, Mel. You got to come with us. My dad told me to bring anyone I wanted. We can give you a ride home after if you want. It'll be fun. You do remember fun, don't you? Nope. I don't do parties. No, thanks. I trot out excuses, homework, strict parents, tuba practice, late night dentist appointments, I have to feed the warthogs. I don't have a good track record with parties. David doesn't bother to analyze my reluctance. If he were a girl, maybe he would have pleaded a line for Guys don't do that. Yes, no, stay, go. Suit yourself, see you Monday. I think it's kind of a, some kind of psychiatric disorder when you have more than one personality in your head. That's what it feels like when I walk home. The two Melindas fight every step of the way. Melinda one is pissed that she couldn't go to the party. Melinda one, get a life. It's just pizza. He wasn't going to try anything. His parents were going to be there. You worry too much. You're never going to have let us have any fun, are you? You're going to turn into one of those weird old ladies with hundreds of cats who calls the cops when kids cut across her backyard. I can't stand you. Melissa two waits for one to finish her tantrum. Two carefully watches, watches the bush along the sidewalk for a lurking boogeyman or worse. 
Melinda too. The world is a dangerous place. You don't know what would happen. What if he were just standing, uh, saying his parents were going to be there? He could have been lying. He could never tell when people are lying. Assume the worst plan for disaster. Now hurry up, get us home. I don't like it out here. It's too dark. If I kick both of them out of my head, who would be left? I can't sleep after the game. Again. I spent a couple of hours tuning AM radio to the weird bounces of the night. I listened to Jibber Jabber from Quebec, a farm report from Minnesota, and a country station from Nashville. I crawl out of my window into the porch roof and wrap myself in all of my blankets. A fat white seed sleeps in the sky. Slush is frozen over. People say that winter lasts forever, and because and it's because they obsess over the thermometer. North in the mountains and maple syrup is trickling, brave geese punch through the thin ice left on the lake. Underground pale seeds roll over from their sleep, starting to get restless, starting to dream green. The moon looked closer back in August. So I will say this is where she's about to explain her um, sexual assault. Um, if that is something that is triggering to you, it'll go for the next page. Um, but then that's the end of this, this chapter. Rachel got us to the end of the summer party, a cheerleader party with beer and seniors and music. She blackmailed her brother Jimmy to drive us. We were all sleeping over at Rachel's house. Her mother thought Jimmy was taking us roller skating. It was at a farm a couple of miles from our development. The kegs were in the barn where the speakers were set up. Most people hung at the edges of the lights. They looked like models in blue jean ads, thin, 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 big lips, big earrings, white smiles. Felt like such a kid. Rachel found a way to fit in, of course. She knew a lot of people because of Jimmy. I tasted a beer. It was worse than cough medicine. I gulped it down, another beer, and one more. Then I worried I would throw up. I walked out of the crowd towards the woods. The moon shone on the leaves. I could see the lights like stars strung in the pines. Somebody giggled, hidden beyond the dark. Quiet boy-girl whispers. I couldn't see them. A step behind me, a senior. And then he was talking to me, flirting with me, this gorgeous cover model guy. His hair was way better than mine. Every inch a tanned muscle and his, he had straight white teeth. Flirting with me, who was Rachel? She had to see this. Greek God, where did you come from? You're too beautiful to hide in the dark. Come dance with me. He took my hand and pulled me close to him. I breathed in cologne and beer and something I couldn't identify. I fit in against his body perfectly, my head level with his shoulder. I was a little dizzy. I laid my cheek on his chest. He wrapped one arm around my back. His other hand slid down to my butt. I thought that was a little rude, but my tongue was thick with beer and I couldn't figure out how to tell him to slow down. The music was sweet. This was what high school was supposed to feel like. Where was Rachel? She had to see this. He tilted my face up to his. He kissed me, man, kiss, hard, sweet, and deep. Nearly knocked me off my feet, that kiss. And I thought just for a moment there that I had a boyfriend and I would start School with a boyfriend, older and stronger and ready to watch out for me. He kissed me again. His teeth ground hard against my lips. It was hard to breathe. A cloud cloaked the moon. Shadows looked like photo negatives. Do you want to? He asked. What did he say? I didn't answer. I didn't know. I didn't speak. We were on the ground. And when did that happen? No. No, I did not like this. I was on the ground and he was on top of me. My lips mumble something about leaving, about a friend who needs me, about my parents worrying. I can hear myself mumbling, I'm a, or I'm a mumbling like a deranged drunk. His lips lock on mine and I can't say anything. I twist my head away. He's so heavy. There's a boulder on me. I open my mouth to breathe, to scream, and his hand covers it. In my head, my voice is as clear as a bell. No, I don't want to, but I can't spit it out. I'm trying to remember how we got on the ground and where the moon went and wham, sure enough, shirts down and the ground smells wet and dark and no, I'm not really here. I'm definitely back at Rachel's crimping my hair and gluing on fake nails. He smells like beer and mean and he hurts me, hurts me, hurts me and gets up and zips his jeans and smiles. The next thing I saw was the telephone. I stood in the middle of a drunken crowd and called 911 because I needed help. All of those visits from Officer Friendly in the second grade paid off. The lady answered the phone, please state your emergency. And I saw myself in the window over the kitchen sink and no words came out of my mouth. Who was that girl? 
I never seen her before. Tears oozed down my face, over my bruised lips, coiling into the headset. It's okay, said the nice lady on the phone. We have your locations. Officers are on the way. Are you hurt? Are you being threatened? Someone grabbed the phone from my hands and listened. A scream. The cops were coming. Blue and cherry lights flashed in the kitchen sink window. Rachel's face so angry in mine. Someone slapped me. I crawled out of the room through a forest of legs. Outside, the moon smiled goodbye and slipped away. I walked home without a word. It isn't August. The moon is asleep, and I'm sitting on my porch roof like a frozen gargoyle, wondering if the sun is going to blow off the world today and sleep in. There's blood in the snow. I bite my lip clear through. It needs stitches. Moms will be late again. I hate winter. I lived in Santa Cruz my whole life, and I hate winter. It starts too early and ends too late. No one likes it. Why does anyone stay here? My report card. Social life, F. Lunch, D. Clothes, F. Social studies, F. Biology, D+. Plus. English, D+. Plus. Spanish, D. Algebra, F. Gym, D. Art, D.